This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. First, I'd like to ask, uh, who's been here for all four science on Saturdays? Great, future scientists like it. This is the last of four science on Saturday presentations for this year. For 20 years, the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory has put together scientists and local science educators demonstrating cutting edge technologies and theories for your education. Normally, this is where I jump into the topic, but first I want to thank all the people involved in making science on Saturday successful. The camera operators, the sound technicians that are off stage, the graphic artists that create the presentation slides and those in the booth behind you that make the operation smooth running and to those that make the live streaming possible. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs> but I also want to honor a person that's been the mainstay of Science on Saturdays for many other science and technology education projects throughout the region, Dick Farnsworth. He's the gentleman that just gave you. Here is some of his history. Working for Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, he has had many hats, but all in education. Biotech hub manager, manager, science and technology education program manager, manager for education outreach, and many more. He directed the development and implementation of the lab at the lab of a variety of professional development programs for teachers and enrichment programs for students in biotechnology, biophotonics, fusion, astrophysics, and technology for web development. He holds a Master of Education in Education Psychology from Brigham Young University and formerly was a school counselor on the White Mountain Apache Reservation. He is instrumental in, instrumental in making sure that Science on Saturday brings you the best science for your continued education. He has officially retired as of last month, but he commands the respect of his peers and has influenced many students in the scientific community. Please join me in honoring and thanking Mr. Farnsworth for his years of devotion to educate us in science. You'll, you'll notice he ducked off the stage here. So. <laughs> Our topic today is cardioid pro the Cardio Project, simulating the human heart on the world of the world's fastest supercomputers. Dr. R David Richards and biology teacher Aaron McKay will discuss the complexities of a computer, <coughs> computer model of the human heart using the power of Sequoia's 1.6 million CPUs. Aaron has been working at Tracy High for 12 years she is a biology teacher and works, she also takes part in the extra activities like Wakesman Student Scholars Program, Biotechnology, Science Olympiad. Aaron is dedicated to the WSSP Genetic Research Program that will give students an option for learning about bioinformatics. It's all falling apart. And about lab science in college. If Aaron has not become, uh, had not become a teacher, she would have been a scientist in plant pathology or microbiology. And we're glad she chose education. Dr. David Richards is a computational physicist in the Physical and Life Sciences Directorate at the Livermore Lab. In addition to his academic background, Dr. Richards earned recognition by being a team member that earned the 2007 Gordon Bell Prize for a first-of-a-kind simulation of the Kelvin Helmholtz instability in molten metals on blue gene L and garnered a 2012 Director's, Director's Award as part of the Cimarron Project team dedicated to the prediction and measurement of properties of dense, highly collisional, and strongly coupled plasmas. Please welcome Aaron and David. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you and good morning. Thanks for coming out to Science on Saturday. My name is David Richards and I'm going to be talking about a, a research project that we've been doing using the human heart and one of the world's most powerful supercomputers. As I was getting ready to give this talk, I thought back to the first time that I ever used a computer. And I was about the same age as probably some of you, eighth grade, when my junior high school set up a computer lab that had three, count them, three computers in it. Now those little computers were really not at all powerful compared to what we have today. But they taught me two things really quickly. The first thing is that computers do exactly what you tell them to do, which is not the same as what you want them to do. <laughs> and the second thing is that figuring out what to tell a computer so that it does do what you want was, for me, a really interesting activity. All right, I thought it was really fun and I just loved it. All right, and that passion turned into a hobby, and that hobby turned into a job, and now today it's my job to program computers that are as big as a house and have over a million processors. And the best thing of all is, even with all those changes, when I sit down with that giant supercomputer and try to figure out how to make it do what I want, it's just as much fun as it was 30 years ago in that little tiny computer lab at Olympus Junior High School. I, I, I just love that part of my job. Now, another thing that I really love is getting to work with really good people. And I want you to understand that the research I'm going to tell you about today is not something I did by myself. I'm just one member of a large team of people from the lab and from IBM who all played critical roles in the research that we're going to talk about today. And I want to give my thanks to them because they're truly great people to work with. All right. So, what are we going to learn today? Uh, three main things. First of all, why is it that scientists use uh, simulation and modeling, right? What's wrong with experiments? Second, how do you create a model that a computer can use to simulate or to act like a, a real object? And third, what are the advantages and disadvantages, uh, disadvantages, and there are some disadvantages, to using a supercomputer? Now, this project started about three years ago when some friends at, uh, at, at IBM came to us and they said, how would you like to help us out with the research project trying to figure out the interaction between heart problems and, and drugs? You know, medical science has done some really remarkable things and we have some great drugs that can help take care of heart problems. All right, and I bet many of us know people who have heart arrhythmias and other heart issues that, and that medicine can really help them. But sometimes that medicine doesn't work as well as it's supposed to. And you see the headline there from the New York Times, sometimes antibiotics, even drugs that are supposed to make your heart work better, actually can cause it to suddenly stop. All right, not a very good thing. And so the, the drug companies, the government, scientists, we all want to answer the same question. How do we choose the right drugs, and how do we make sure the drugs we give people are safe? Now, as a scientist, your first well, inclination, your first instinct would be, well, let's go do some experiments. But wait a minute, we're, we're talking about your heart here. So experiments might not be the best idea. All right. Uh, and this is exactly where simulation comes into the picture. This is one of the primary reasons that scientists use modeling and simulation. Because sometimes experiments are too dangerous, they're too difficult, or they're just too expensive. All right. When you do a, an experiment with hazardous chemicals, you've got to take all kinds of precaution, and when you're done, you have this hazardous waste that you have to get rid of. But when it's a simulation, you just delete the files, and it's all gone. It's great. <laughs> all right? You know, if you have to build cars and crash them into each other, that's really expensive. But on a simulation, you just reset the simulation, and the car's as good as new. This bicycle helmet, this is a story I read about a couple, of, uh, a couple of months ago. It's a great story. Louis Garneau, the bicycle equipment manufacturer, they used to design their helmets by making clay models and putting together a production line and making a helmet, taking it to a wind tunnel and testing it. It was a really slow and laborious process. And a few years ago, they said, you know what, why don't we use computer simulations instead? And they found out that they could design a computer model and test a helmet in a single day. Not only that, the computer models that, they, that they, they were using enabled them to understand really well how the airflow was going on the inside of the helmet, which was something they couldn't measure in the wind tunnel. Now, if you're a rider, you care about that because that airflow is what keeps your head cool. And they were able to get better data and design better helmets faster. Now, you might ask, why does this matter? 
In 1989, Laurent Fignon was 50 seconds ahead of Greg LeMond going into the last stage of the Tour de France. All right, and Greg LeMond strapped on one of these aerodynamic helmets, and Fignon ran with a plain old helmet with his ponytail sticking out the back. LeMond won the Tour that year by eight seconds with the advantage of that aerodynamic helmet. So it makes a big difference. In fact, they did some calculations afterwards and figured out that if, if Fignon had just cut off his ponytail, the decrease in drag would have been enough for him to save that eight seconds and actually win the Tour. <laughs> All right, so here's just another example of how simulation allow you to make very detailed observations about the system you're trying to study. If you take an electrocardiogram, just you know, put some leads on someone's chest, you get a nice little green trace like that. And that tells you some things about the electrical activity of the heart, but not nearly as much as in a simulation where you can inquire about every single point in the heart and know what's going on electrically everywhere in the whole system. You just get better data or at least you get more detailed data. And finally, simulations allow you to evaluate very complex models. Um, if you had a model that just involved two atoms and you had to figure out the distance between them and figure out what the forces were, if you only had two atoms, you could do that with a pencil and paper by hand. It'd be really easy. Well, what if you didn't have two? What if you had about a dozen? All right, now you probably don't want to do this by pencil and paper with hand. What if you didn't have a dozen? What if you had nine billion? All right, that's what a computer can do. And in, in the introduction today, I mentioned a Kelvin Helmholtz instability simulation that we did a few years ago, and this is it. We took a bunch of atoms, they formed fluids, and they're sheared across each other. And you can see these nice, looping, very complex wave, uh, waves that form as a result of just the individual interactions between pairs of atoms. Don't forget, all we're doing is just calculating those individual interactions between pairs. You could never do that by hand, but a computer allows you to test theories using these very complicated and very, very large-scale models. When I see a simulation like that, I think about a computer, and I think about the fact that really, for all of their power, they don't do very many things. In reality, a computer chip can only do about three things. It can load values from memory, it can store values to memory, and it can do simple mathematics, add, subtract, multiply, divide. That's pretty much it, all right? The C++ language that you might have programmed a computer in, it only has 74 words in the entire language, and you don't use about two-thirds of them most of the time. And so it's a really interesting question, how do you use something that simple to do simulations that complicated? How do you get a computer to act like a human heart? All right, and to understand that the first thing you have to do is you have to understand the biological system. You have to understand the heart. And so that's where I'm gonna bring in Aaron McKay, who is a biologist, <laughs> a biology teacher, and can tell us a little bit about the heart. So first, I'm going to pick up this paper before one of us kills ourselves. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so why do we need a heart? We all know our hearts are important. We all, all know they're essential. But why do we really need it? What does it do for us? Well, the main thing it really does is it's just a big pump. Well, not that big, but it's a major pump in our body. So our lungs gather oxygen and transport it to our blood. But the blood that is now oxygenated returns to our heart our heart pumps, and now the oxygenated blood has been taken to our body. Every cell of your body requires oxygen to carry out its metabolic activities of life. Now in that process, waste products called carbon dioxide and other waste products are produced, and they are gathered up back by the blood and returned to your heart through your veins. Now once it's returned to your heart, oh wait, time to pump again. And now the blood is pumped back to your lungs. The carbon dioxide is released back out. That's what we call exhalation. And you inhale again and repeat the process all over again. But yes, it's a pump, but it's a four-chambered pump. So if we take a look here at the heart diagram, it's very simplified, but it gets the point across. There we can see the path, the lungs, the body, back to the heart, back to the lungs. 
Well, the two top chambers are called atria, and they're actually really thin-walled chambers that are on the top part of your heart, and you have your right atria and your left atria. You might have noticed that it looks like it's labeled backwards, but that's because that would be my heart in my body facing you, not your heart in your body right now, okay? And then we have the left ventricle. So the atria receive the blood back from the body and the lungs and then transfer the blood down to the ventricles. The ventricles is the thick muscular part of the heart that actually pumps with significant force to actually get the blood out of your heart and back to your body or back to your lungs. Though it's easier to get back to your lungs than it is to get to your toes and top of your head and therefore the right ventricle is actually a little less muscular than the left ventricle. Now, to coordinate the pumping requires an electrical system. Now, you might have heard of the pacemaker. It has a more technical name. If you're like me and you can't spell, you just call it the SA node. If you can actually spell sinoatrial node, yay for you. Okay. And that initiates the electrical signal in the atria, and then that electrical signal spreads from cell to cell throughout all of the atria, from left atria and right atria. And then we get to the AV node. And again, yet another word I can't spell, but I can spell AV. And there the signal is passed down through the ventricle to the Purkinje fibers. And when the Purkinje fibers receive that electrical signal, that initiates the contraction of the ventricles, the blood is pushed out of the heart to the body and to the lungs. And that is the fundamentals of the electrical system when it's working properly. But as we know with all things in biology and all things in life, not everything works properly all of the time. And that leads us to sudden cardiac death sometimes. When the signals are having a few issues, and there are many different ways that things can go wrong. And so we can see here that we have the, the proper electrical signal being passed from the SA node to the AV node to the Purkinje fibers. And then we can also see that sometimes we have arrhythmias, and there are multiple types of arrhythmias, but to help us understand the multiple types of arrhythmias, we're gonna explore a few through our arrhythmia dance troupe. So their arms are going to model the atria, their legs are gonna model the ventricles. And we're just gonna take ourselves through a few of the different ways that your heart can beat. Starting with your normal sinus rhythm, where your atria contracts and your ventricles contract. Your atria contract and your ventricles contract. Atria, ventricles. Atria, ventricles. And that is when everything is normal. <laughs> now there are many ways things can go wrong, so let's explore when there is a little blockage in the bundle block, which is the connection between the AV node and the Purkinje fibers. And so things go a little awry. As we can see, the ventricle had a bit of an issue. Now, atrial fibrillation. Not a great thing to have happen, but it's not absolutely the end of the world. The atria go a little spastic. <laughs> and then, finally, let's see. When it just all goes wrong, the heart goes into spasm, and you are effectively not pumping any blood anywhere, and therefore you're not getting oxygen where it needs to go, and all sorts of complications arise, and that is ventricular fibrillation. And that is our dance troupe, <laughs> illustrating the heart. Thank you, guys. All right. All right, so hopefully 
that makes the whole idea of a cardiac arrhythmia somewhat clear to you. Thanks again to, to our dance troupe. So when we understand the biology of the heart, we realize that there are a couple things we're going to need. Right, we're going to need some accurate anatomic data so we know about the shape of the heart, about those, those ventricles we're really going to focus on because that's the most important blood pumping part of the heart. So where do you get that kind of data? Now, how many of you have played Fruit Ninja? <laughs> All right. All right. So Fruit Ninja is a great game. You get to slice these fruits in half. When you slice them in half, you get to see all the internal structure. You can see exactly what the fruit looks like inside. Now, it turns out that a few years ago, the National Library of Medicine did essentially the same thing to a human body from someone who had donated their body to science. You want to see what it looks like? <laughs> there it is. All right. They took this, this, this body and they froze it and they sliced it up in a whole bunch of really thin slices and they took pictures of every slice so you can see exactly what the internal structure of the body looks like. And you can take those slices and you can flip through them and you can put the images all together and form a 3D model of exactly what that person's heart looks like. And we were able to go back and get that data and get a computer model, a computerized geometry of exactly what this person's heart looks like. And so we've got good data to use in our simulation. Now we take that data and like I said, computers can just load and store values. All right, so just like a digital photograph, where you basically have a big grid, and at every grid there's a pixel, which is a certain color, that's what the photograph is made out of, we do pretty much the same thing with the heart, except our grid, instead of being in two dimensions, is three-dimensional, and instead of having a color for each pixel, we have either a heart cell or not a heart cell. And by looking at every point in that grid, we can tell the shape of the heart. We can tell the computer what the shape of the heart is. All right, so that's the shape. Now the next thing is we talked about the electrical system. So we need to know more about how the electrical system works. So you can look at a nerve cell's electrical system. You can look at the cardiac myocyte electrical system. Cardiac myocyte, just a fancy word for heart, muscle, cell. So if we take a look, we see those graphs are similar and yet they are different. If we look at the nerve cell uh, graph, we can see that nerve cells, they fire and they recover very quickly. They recover so quickly that actually if we were to continue with this on, we could see that nerve cells could fire, 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 fire. But the cardiac myocyte cell, it's much, much longer recovery comparatively. Now we are looking milliseconds, so milliseconds seem like short to us, but for a cell, recovery or repolarizing, it's quite a long time. And that helps coordinate and regulate the cell. Now, how is it that the cardiac myocyte can actually change its voltage? Well, it has to do with gates and channels. Now, this is a super simplified image, but we have gates and channels regulating the movement of ions into and out of the cell, and therefore changing the voltage of the cell. And that is responsible for that graph we see there. The graph is just an illustration of the change of voltage, what we call the action potential. And that ultimately will help regulate the heart's um, electrical system and allow our heart to beat. Okay, so we've got gates and channels and we've got flow. How do we make a computer model that? And to understand, let me go to a different example. Let's suppose that we have a tank full of water and there is water flowing out of it. All right, how do you tell how much water is left in the tank? Well, let's assume for a minute that the rate at which the water is flowing out of the tank is five gallons a minute. In calculus, we would say that means dv dt, or the change in volume with the change in time, is five gallons per minute. And if you think about it, you can solve that equation pretty easily, right? That means we have 1,000 gallons to start with, multiply the rate times the time, 5t, that's the amount of water in the tank, right? Great, easy. <laughs> One problem, that's not the right physics. If you have a tank like this, the water does not flow out at a constant rate, all right? It flows out at a rate that depends on what kind of liquid it is, how big the hole is, and most importantly, how much water, H, how high is that water column in the tank? And the lower the water gets, the more slowly the water flows out. Well, now it's kind of hard to figure out what V is. This kind of equation is called a differential equation, and they've been used in modeling for centuries. And people have figured out some very clever ways to solve some particular kinds of differential equations as long as they're not too complicated. 
But the problem is, if you're talking about all the gates and channels of a heart and all the various kinds of ions that are moving back and forth, you need a lot of differential equations to describe that. And they're pretty complicated, more complicated than you could ever do by hand. That's where the computer comes in. And this is where the computer is really great. Because if we wanted to solve this tank differential equation using a computer, we could do it this way. We could say, well, OK, I know what the water height is. I can calculate that rate of change, that dv dt, from the water height. All right, I know what the volume started at. And I can take that rate and multiply it by a small amount of time and figure out a new volume. And from the new volume, I can get the new height, and that gives me a rate, and that gives me a new volume, and that gives me a height, and a rate, and, a and we just go around that circle over and over and over with little tiny time steps, and we can watch how the rate changes as the water drains out of the tank. And of course, a computer doesn't care if there's one equation or 20. It doesn't care if the equations are simple or hard. It just does the math for you. And so differential equations and representing physical, equ physical systems as differential equations is a very, very powerful technique for computer modeling, and one we use all the time. All right, so that's how we're going to get our hands around that action potential and understand how an individual cell works. But understanding an individual cell isn't enough. It's great to know how the, the electrons are moving, or the, the, uh, the, the charge is moving back and forth across the cell membrane. That tells you what a, a cell does, how it pumps charge back and forth. But what you really want to understand is the whole, arg the whole heart organ and how that charge moves across the entire organ. All right? And so the way we do that is we need to understand that each cell in the heart is connected essentially by a series of resistors. All right? And that signal travels from cell to cell within the heart. Now, to give you an idea how that works, how many of you have ever been to a stadium and seen a, a wave cheer, right? Probably everybody, right? Okay, good. So we're going to practice here. We're all going to be heart cells, all right? And we're going to start down here in this corner, all right? And, and just like a heart cell, when, when, when one heart cell fires, the heart cell next to it gets the message, and then it fires. All right, so let's practice. Down here, you ready? We're going to start down here. Everybody has to do a wave cheer. All right, you ready? On your mark, get set, go. Great, okay, now, can we see that on instant replay? I think we have this, just a second. All right, here we go, all right. All right, great. Now, what you should notice is that cheer moves pretty evenly from front to back in the auditorium, right? But once again, the problem is that's not how the heart actually works, <laughs> okay? Because in your heart, you have fibers, and the signal can move faster in some directions than it moves in others, all right? So we're going to try this again, doing it the way your actual heart would do it, okay? So this time, when we do the wave cheer, when the person next to you stands up, you make sure you stand up right away. But when the person in front of you stands up, count to one before you stand up. That's just like the heart, where it's going to be faster in one direction than in the other. This is called anisotropic, not the same in both directions. All right, you think you can do it? Okay, here we go. You ready? All right. You ready? On your mark, get set, go. Oh boy. <laughs> if you guys were my heart, I'm not, I think I'd be in big trouble. All right. But hey, let's see it on instant replay, okay? All right, here we go. expecting, but still pretty good. It gives you the idea, right, that the, that, the, that the wave moved faster from one side to the other than it did from front to back. You want to try one more? Okay. <laughs> one more. 
All right, somebody in the middle of the auditorium, put your hand up. All right, and if you're next, then put your hand up. More hands, more hands, more hands. Okay, right. All of you people with your hands up, you, well, see, not quite so far back. All right, middle of the auditorium, okay. All of you people with your hands up, you are dead cells, okay? <laughs> you are an infarction, okay? And so when the wave comes to you, no matter what happens, you do not stand up. Okay, you ready? All right, on your mark, get set, go! Okay, pretty good. All right, and now, of course, we have to have the instant replay. And I want you to notice something, that the people in the middle of the back, their timing is way off on this. Okay, and it's not their fault. <laughs> See those people in the middle on the back? They're really late. But it's not their fault because the signal didn't get to them at the right time because this dead spot in the middle. And those are the kinds of things that can go wrong with your heart that make it beat oddly. All right, and those are the kinds of things that we want to be able to simulate. All right, so hopefully what you've gotten the idea here of as we've talked about these modeling principles is you understand a little bit better how we make a computer model. All right, first of all, it's absolutely essential that you understand the detailed science of whatever, of, of whatever system it is you're trying to simulate. Being a computer scientist isn't enough. You have to be a physical scientist too. Second of all, it's really important to get relevant data. Get the best data you possibly can from whatever experiments you can find because that will make your simulation more accurate. And finally, you have to develop a mathematical model that describes the time variation of the, of the system. And often that involves, as we were saying, differential equations. All right, so last part of the talk. Why is it that you need a giant supercomputer to simulate a heart anyway? All right, we have one. It's a great machine. This is Sequoia at the lab. Almost 1.6 million cores, all right? Um, 55 petabytes in the file system. Most of you on your hard drives at home, you probably have, what, a one terabyte hard drive? 55 terabytes is 55,000 one terabyte hard drives. We can store a lot of, of stuff on our disks and 40 kilometers of cable to hook this whole thing together. It's a great machine. All right, now, to give you an idea of what we can do with that much power, we can make simulations go faster but we can also make them more realistic. All right, and to help you understand what this, what, what more realistic looks like, if we could make a simulation 100,000 times more realistic, what would that be like? Well, some of you, some more retro people in the crowd, <laughs> may have played Pac-Man. This was a favorite game when I was a kid. All right, now Pac-Man ran on a very old, a very old processor that could do 3.1 megaflops. That means that it could compute three million floating point operations you know, add, subtract, multiply, divide, every second. Now you might say three million, that sounds like an awful lot just for something simple like Pac-Man. But actually Pac-Man had to do a lot of things. You had to read the controller, you had to, you know, control the ghost, they had kind of like an artificial intelligence that would chase the player, had to make sure that Pac-Man didn't walk through the walls of the maze. There's, there's a fair amount going on there. And that's what that, uh, what that 3.1 megaflops was good for. Now, fast forward today, it turns out that the modern graphics card that you might have in your computer is about 100,000 times more powerful than that processor that made Pac-Man work. And so what do you get for that factor of 100,000? Well, you get Assassin's Creed, okay? When you think about it, it's really the same game. Okay, you still have a character who's moving around, have to read the controller, he's being chased by enemies, he can't walk through the walls, all right, but the difference is that with this additional realism, you can see his robes blowing in the wind and you can watch him make footprints in the sand as he walks, all right? Now that kind of power and that kind of realism, we can apply to our heart modeling. To give you an idea why this makes a difference, when we put together our heart model on Sequoia, we went back and we tried to find the fastest, most detailed heart simulation that had been published up to that point. And that represents the blue dot on this curve. And our simulation is the red dot on this curve. And I'm going to show you exactly how fast data comes out of the computer for those two models. You ready? Here we go. 
The red dot is cardioid on sequoia, and the blue dot is what we could do before. Yeah, I promise you, the blue dot is actually moving. <laughs> But all this extra speed and detail allows us to do a lot more simulations, test a lot more cases, try more drugs, figure out what the uncertainty in our calculation is by doing multiple replicas. And so this kind of power of a supercomputer really makes a difference. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> it's not really that easy, right? If you could just have that power for free, then everybody would do it. Making a parallel supercomputer work is actually kind of hard. And to understand why, imagine that you needed to paint your house. That's a big job. Be easier if you had somebody to help you, right? That's kind of doing it in parallel. And so you send out the word to your friends that if they'll show up on the weekend and help you paint your house, you'll give them pizza. Now, imagine that more people than you were expecting showed up. In fact, a lot more people than you were expecting showed up. Imagine that a million people showed up to help you paint your house. <laughs> I think you can see what's going to happen. It's not going to work very well, is it? All right, you're going to have to pass out brushes. You're going to have to clean brushes. Everybody's going to paint about one square inch of the house, right? And by the time you've done all the passing out of paint and brushes and cleaning and everything else, it probably took you longer to paint the house than it would have to do it by yourself. And to make matters worse, you've got the world's largest pizza bill. <laughs> Right? And, and this is what it's like with real parallel computers. All right? You have to figure out how to assign the work to the computer so that they can all do something effective at all times. I got one more demo to show you, to show you how this works. Now I need a couple of people from the audience. Where, okay, oh, how about these two over here? Okay, come on up. All right, where'd they go? Coming. Okay. All right, now, we would like the two of you, one of you stand right here, one of you stand over there. Okay, now, the two of you, I want you to pretend that you are a computer, because we both have a math problem for you. We're gonna show you this math problem, and I want you to solve this math problem as quickly as you can. So when you know the answer, holler it out. You ready? Okay, on your mark, you ready, Aaron? Mm -hmm. On your mark, get set, go. All right, you win. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Oh, look, a prize. Okay. Uh, oh, and a participation prize. Right. Now, now let me ask you a question. Was that fair? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Obviously, that wasn't fair, right? When you give one processor an easy problem and one processor a hard problem, they can't finish at the same rate. So it's very important when you do a, a parallel computer simulation that you balance out the work. Back. And that was a particular problem for us because the heart has a very complicated geometry. And so figuring out how to split the different parts, the heart up across the processor was one of the things that we really struggled with and we really had to do some work to make that, to make that effective. All right, but in the end, we figured out some good ways and I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish up here by showing you some simulations that we actually did. Now, what I'm showing you here is a wedge of, of the heart. So just one little chunk taken out of the wall of the heart. And on one side, the model has been changed. Some of the channels have been blocked as if there was a drug present. And on the other side, there's no drug. Now, I'm going to put this movie in motion. And what you're going to see is, first of all, there's a stimulus, an electrical stimulus that starts. And you can see that the heart will excite. That's the electrical wave moving across. And then relax. Now we're gonna come along with an abnormal stimulus. Maybe you got hit in the chest with a baseball. There's the abnormal stimulus. Now on the no drug side, you'll see that we excite and, 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 and the, the wave goes away. But on the, on the drug side, that wave keeps going in kind of a circular rotating spiral fashion. Now those spiral waves are exactly what makes your heart not beat regularly. It's, it's this kind of stuff, right? All right? They did it pretty well? Okay. <laughs> All right? And so when you see those kinds of spiral waves, that's an indication of a heart arrhythmia. All right, but we can do it not just on a wedge, we can do it on the whole heart. All right, so there is a normal beat. All right, it excites and it relaxes. And now we're gonna come along and you're gonna see an abnormal beat and that same kind of spiral, looping, twisting, abnormal, 
boy, I'm glad this is not my heart that's doing this. <laughs> All right? I think it's fascinating to watch this. I really do. But that is a heart that is not doing the right thing. And again, the wonderful part about computer simulation is that you don't get to see it from just one angle. You get to see it from every angle. And you can study it. And this is the same heart, same simulation, just viewed from six different angles. So you can see the different sides of the rotation and the spirals. And you can study it and learn about what's going on. All right. So just watch that for a second. So that's what we're using to start to understand how different drugs interact with your heart and either cause or inhibit these kinds of, of arrhythmi, arrhythmias and, 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 and dysfunctional electrical patterns. All right, so we're also working on a new simulation, a new set of simulations. Everything I've shown you so far, the heart doesn't actually move, right? You saw the electrical waves, but the heart wasn't actually pumping. It's actually a harder problem, but it's what we've been working on for the last year and we're just starting to get results. And now we have a new simulator that can do this, that can do this. There we go. All right. And so that's our next big challenge, to put together this mechanical motion with the electrical motion and get ourselves a next generation simulator with some truly revolutionary capabilities. All right, so that brings us to a wrap up. What have we learned today? Hopefully you now understand why it is that scientists use modeling and simulation. It replaces experiments that are too dangerous or too expensive. That if you want to create a computer model that, a, that, a, that, that you can use to simulate a real object, you have to get data and you have to understand the physical system. And finally, supercomputers are very helpful at dealing with complex models and getting great reality but you have to program them really carefully to get past the parallel overhead. And so with that, thank you all very much for coming. It's been my pleasure to explain our work. Thank you.